to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. The place for all things guitar and gear. Here are your hosts, Chris, Jesse, and Robert. Thank you, Scott Fletcher. Welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, your fortnightly webcast for all things guitar and gear. I'm Chris. With me tonight is Jesse. Hello. And Robert, again, is not with us. He's not um, well. No, he's, he's got a good excuse this time. Yeah. He's more. He's even more uh, vitamins or fruit or something. Yeah. If you caught uh, Hour of Awesome last night or the one we recorded last night, uh, he talked a little bit about being ill and down in Red Bulls to get himself through the show. <laughs> um, and uh, the Red Bulls were just not enough for tonight. So he, he emailed me and said, can't do it. So it's just Jesse and I tonight. Um and so we'll go ahead and get the show rolling here. So, Jesse, I know you've been gone uh, for a good chunk of this week. So I'll ask you, instead of what you've been doing this week guitar-wise, which I assume is probably little to nothing, uh, what have you done recently guitar-wise? So, uh, well, a couple of things. Actually, this week I was traveling. So um, I, I'll show you the travel guitar. So this is a little Steinberger Spirit guy you can see. That's cool. Yeah, so it's a full-scale guitar. It's a 20, I think it's a 24-inch scale, maybe a 24 and 3 quarter. So it's not like a full strat scale, but it's pretty darn close and has, you know, all the pickups and bridge and everything, but you no know, headstock, all the tunings at the other end with these little tuners. So it keeps it really small and easy to uh, pack in an overhead on a plane, play in a car without taking out the driver, you know, right. so it's, uh, it's actually really good. So, um, anyway, so I, I was playing some scales and whatnot there. Um, the big thing, I guess, did we talk about my guitar coming back? No, we could. We could pick that second part of the uh, show. We will talk about my guitar coming back from right. the Luthier. So that's probably the biggest thing. Um, and that's pretty much what I've been doing. Cool. So you took that traveling guitar with you? I did. That's awesome. So yeah. it's probably, it's close to an LP scale then. If it's 20, yes. yeah, 24, I think LP is 24 and three quarter. So even if it's just 24, it's pretty close. Yeah, and it's got 24 frets, so they feel a little tight to a person used to 22 frets and a, and a 25 and a half inch scale. Oh, but, yeah, sure. Um, but it's not bad, and uh, it's got a chunky neck on it, which is not my normal thing. But um, but it's really nice in that it ha has a little fold-out guy here, so it rests right on your leg. Cool. And then if you're standing, of course, you don't need that. And it's just a really small piece of wood. It's not really that high tech. In fact, they, I, I, I have a really old beat up one that doesn't even have a trim. It's just got like a, uh, a what am I saying, hardtail on it. And, um, but hey, that's all you need for something for, for travel. Because, you know, they make those little Les Pauls, uh, Flying V, Stratocasters, whatever. But the scale yeah. is so small on them that even at the, the low, you know, F position, it feels like you're playing an octave up. Yeah. So it's kind of, and then once you're up in the higher frets, of course, it's, it's out of hand. So yeah. uh, that's cool. Now, is that two humbuckers and a single coil in the middle? It is. So yeah, two humbuckers, standard switching arrangement. So you have a humbucker, the uh, split, and then the middle, just the middle, split bridge, and then just the, or just the neck. Yeah. That's cool. They're not the great, these are EMG select pickups, which are, what's the technical term? kind of crap <laughs> yeah. i mean they work they, they they give you the basic sound but they don't really have much soul to them um yeah. most people if you're going to use it you'd replace them but they give you the basic idea and then you plug them into some kind of headphone amp you know with headphones and you're good to go yeah i mean that's all you're looking for anyway for a travel guitar you're not necessarily looking for the world's greatest pickups i mean right. you're right. Yeah, you're just happy to have a guitar with you more than anything else exactly yeah cool Cool. Well, you know, I've been uh, continuing on my journey through the blues and um, working on building good solos, but also working on rhythm parts, playing a 12 bar, uh, 12, uh, 12 bar progression without um, the standard two finger blues technique, you know. And so right. looking at uh, full on seventh chords and how to put 13th chords in there and some ninth chords and uh, just sort of messing around with doing some finger gymnastics, trying to get these chord switches down and some of these chords, the 13th chord that I'm is, is just bizarre. And I, there's another fingering of a seventh chord I'm working on too, which is also just weird compared to what I'm used to. I'm used to the sort of the E, um, the E bar shape mm -hmm. for the seventh chord and the a, a bar shape for the seventh chord. And this right. is a little different where, um, I don't really have the set up to, to show an actual fingering, but, 
Uh, all the fingers are on the same fret except for the pinky is uh, one fret up on the G string, I believe. So, right. yeah, and you mute the A string with the first finger. So it's a little uh, strange. Like, I'm still trying to get my fingers used to to that fingering for the chord. But it's cool to be able to, to have different fingerings for the same chord because it's you know adds variety, a little bit of spice while you're playing. Oh, as yeah. Well as, yeah. The same progression over and over and over again. Or else the same fingerings over and over and over again, even if it is the same chords. Oh, yeah. There's some neat things, too, that I'm, I'm kind of playing with with jazz where – um, like you could take a, a just a basic triad, a D major chord or something, and if you take that chord and put it over, uh, let's say, um, oh this gets a little weird, but if you take a, just a triad, like a, let's say a D, and um, if you put that over say a B flat chord, a B flat note, then it actually mm-hmm. becomes like a B flat seven chord, okay, kind of a B flat minor seven, okay. because you have a triad stacked on top of that bass note. And then, of course, if you think about leaving out the third, then you can just take the triad and put it, you know, keep stacking it up. And that's all like sevenths and ninths and elevenths and thirteenth chords are, is you just keep adding these. But if you figure that, hey, if you have a bass player and he plays the bass note or the fifth or like the lower notes in the chord, then you could just play those upper parts and you're only playing triads. Right. Or really even just two notes. I mean, if you, you play a power chord, well, that could be the third and the seventh. Of a chord, and so it, now if you're playing it alone, of course, that's all there is, you know. But if right. you have a bass note or you have a little bass d- rhythm drum machine type of thing, then uh, those are fun to play with, and they're easy fingerings, but they get your ear used to like really higher things, which is pretty right. cool. Right. So sorry, folks, getting into you know no, <laughs> the no. whacking is there, but no, this is all good stuff. I mean, hey, this is the. Uh, it's it's your fortnightly webcast for all things guitar and gear, right? right. So be <laughs> simple and guitar, be, right? be not so simple. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, we probably should add some more not so simple stuff. We've been doing a lot of simple stuff as of late. Uh, before we get to um, your uh, guitar coming back to you, I do want to make a quick announcement for the show. We are now on iTunes, so if uh, our listeners are interested in an audio only. Uh, podcast or they want to subscribe with their iphone for example um you know knock yourself out just look us look for us on itunes and please subscribe you can also subscribe to us on facebook as well so if you want to check us out just uh jester cat studio productions or something like that i don't know i'm sure if you search jester cat on facebook there's not too many things coming up so (laughs) it should be us so anyway um back to the show here sorry for the uh tangent um tell us about this guitar so I took my court to the uh, Luthier in Baltimore, and uh, he refretted it. Um, we talked about this before, what happened, and uh, with stainless steel frets. And I got to say, this thing is, I don't have it here. I'm going next show. I'll just show it to everybody. Um, but uh, you can't tell. I've had a guitar refretted before by a person who was actually not a professional, but uh, a heavy, uh, you know, hobbyist. And he'd okay. done tons of refrets himself. And he didn't do such a great job. Sometimes you pull the frets and wood chips come out and you have to repair that. And just little things where when you're done, you can tell this is not the original factory frets. Um, this one, my gosh, it looked like factory. I mean, it was, they were polished. They were, I mean, there's binding on the neck, you know, the white uh, plastic stripes. And yeah. um, it was flawless he didn't damage anything and it was just perfect wow. the level job the crowning the polishing was just it's smooth as uh, butter to play this wow thing. it's gorgeous he put a new bone nut on and he cut it really well so it um intonates perfectly and uh i just couldn't be happier i mean this is good uh, yeah you know, again i paid as much for this job altogether you know <laughs> as i paid for the, this guitar because it's an import guitar but you know, for the money, you couldn't get a better guitar than than that total. I mean, it's really sure. awesome. So, I, I can't um, wait to check it out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll bring it over because it's really something. Yeah, that's awesome. No, I'm glad it turned out well. I mean, that's the that's like you said, though, there's a difference between having a pro do a job and then somebody who, even if they are a heavy sort of, you know, uh, hobbyist, mm-hmm. you know, there's still a difference between a trained luthier or somebody who, you know, has the tools and the, and obviously that machine that we talked about to do it right. Yeah, it's gonna have like, I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah, and he he said, and I asked him. I had a you know, I was a little chagrined about this. Like, you know, I know how much I, we're we're putting into this, 
and it is an import dex. It's like made in Indonesia, you know. And right. uh, he says, yeah, but after going over it, I mean, everything worked well. The wood was good. He said, this is a good, well-made thing. So uh, he says, yeah. And so uh, he is not like a guitar snob. He's like, if it's a good working guitar and it's what you like, I say go for it. Yeah. Of course, he's doing the job too. But Well, yeah, right. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I trust him. He's, and the other thing is he was a really good player. I mean, when he was uh, going over it and making final adjustments, he was playing some uh, jazz licks that were pretty impressive. And uh, you could tell just from his shop that he's like a guitar nerd. I mean, he had some, you know, everything from some really classic stuff to an old Fender Bassman amp, you know, just an old tube thing to a Hello yeah. Kitty guitar. So, you know, he was class. That's cool. <laughs> that's cool. Um, yeah, that's where in Baltimore is this guy? Um, oh, I don't have the address. Uh, oh, that's all right. In this, he's in this cork factory. Okay, so um, he's in Baltimore City, though. Oh, yeah, he's right in Baltimore. Yeah. Okay. And, um, they, well, I'm happy with his work. So uh, you can uh, look him up, um, philtone.com. His name's Phil. And uh, so he has a website, and he does all kinds of work. Uh, yeah. Really busy on Saturdays. Of course, that's when I had to go down. So, um, sure. So he had other people there. But, yeah, really cool. I mean, he has all all kinds of old radios and all. You know, he's an audio geek too. Nice, nice. But yeah, so I, I have a really good feeling about this. You know, so now I'm thinking, oh, what other guitars need to work? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can see my wife is probably if she's listening to this is probably going to be swearing at you pretty soon. <laughs> now Chris is going to want to do. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I, no, I, you know, here's the thing. You know, you mentioned about being sort of important guitar. I don't think it matters. I mean, if it's the guitar you love and you want to play. It's right. well worth putting money into it. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see the whole, I like with a guitar of the quote unquote putting more into it than what it's worth. Mm-hmm. I don't get that for a guitar. Cause it, again, if, if it's what you want to play, if it's your favorite guitar, if it's your primary thing, spend away, make it to be the guitar you want it to be. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I you agree. Know? So now yeah. I'm, I'm really happy. So now I, now I just have to put the hours into uh, practice. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Now yeah, it's so, on me. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the more you practice, the cheaper it becomes, right? Because if you think right. about it, like, you know, <laughs> that's true. dollar per minute of play, then Absolutely. there you go. So, cool. Excellent. Well, I'm glad it turned out. I'm, like I said, I'm pretty excited to see it. Um, so I thought tonight what we would talk about, uh, if you're willing, would be talking about some scales. Absolutely. Because we've talked about so far um, guitar maintenance. We've talked about how to buy a guitar. We've talked about how to buy an amp. And so we should probably spend a few episodes talking about how to play and uh, not so much to be instructive because, I mean, anyone can do a quick Google search for, you know, Mixolydian scales, fingerings, and you'll find that. Right. But I think it's important to talk about the different scales and why one would use them and um, sort of what makes them different from each other and those kinds of things. And let's just see where the conversation goes. Um, so I thought what we do is uh, I'd play a scale, we talk about it a little bit, and then play another scale, talk about its own, and then a half hour comes by, we stop. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, no, we won't drag it out. We don't want to uh, kill our listeners here by, uh, you know, hour right. of scales. Our stream of consciousness, our, our babbling book, book of consciousness. Yeah, and if we only get the one scale, so be it. So I thought, you know, um, the first scale that we'd start with would be the uh, minor pentatonic, because I think that's the one that, a large number of people learn first. That's true. So let me uh, play through, um, let's say, play it in A so people can hear it, and then we'll um, talk about it. All right. Did you hear that, Jesse? I did. Sounded All right. Good. For those at home, we are still experimenting with how to play a guitar without having it properly mic'd. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, let's get let's be honest. I'm still experimenting with how to play a guitar. So, uh, regardless it's if it's mic'd or not. So anyway, um, minor pentatonic. That's the uh, scale I think a lot of people learn first. Like I mentioned, it's heavily used in blues and rock and uh, many forms of music. Uh, what would you like to say about that? Jesse, minor pentatonic well, scale. What's beautiful about pentatonics in general and minor, tenor, minor pentatonic specifically as well is um, 
is that because it's a pentatonic and penta, there's only five notes in the scale before it, uh, you get the octave and it repeats, is it's, it's open. I mean, it's, it's flexible. You can fit it over a lot of different chord shapes. Um, and it fits in a lot of different places. So I don't want to say there's no bad notes or that you can't hit a sour note or anything like that. Um, but it just makes it flexible when you're playing a progression that you can, that a lot of things just work and sound good. And that's, I think, why it's become the kind of de facto first scale. Incidentally, it wasn't my first scale. I mean, I, I knew like all the, you know, <laughs> you know, major uh, Locrian, Dorian, minor, all, all that stuff before wow. I ever learned the pentatonic. Um, but, uh, but I think it is the best one to be the first scale because, because of that. You can get right into improvisation. Yeah. And uh, and it works well. Later, when you get into well, you've already gotten into it. But when listeners get into um, minor, Dorian, uh, Locrian, other kinds of minor scales, they're uh, they all kind of contain that pentatonic scale because those five notes are in there. Right. So in the scale, you've you've got the the root note, you've got a, a minor third, you got the fourth, and the fifth, and the seventh, and that's it. And then it repeats. And so um, that shows up in other scales that have more notes in them. But it's kind of a skeleton sort of a framework that you can. And it's a great scale for that. Right. Well, yeah. And it's because it's only five notes. Um, what's nice about it, too, is that it's easy to make look, licks with it. Right. Oh, absolutely. And the bends are once you get used to it, you know where they are. They're not hard. Mm -hmm. um you know basically where the bends are especially in the first position or you know i don't know how we want to worry about counting positions but the first one that lots of people learn is usually the index on the root on the e string right and um you know so it's easy to build licks like you said it sounds good with all kinds of different um music and it's pretty hard to play a bad note. If you can play a bad note, I think right. it, it can happen. But it's pretty hard to. Um, so it makes it a nice a beginner scale. And you know, while we're talking about minor pentatonic, um, if you introduce the flat six, then what you have is the blues uh, scale. Mm -hmm. And so we'll play that real quick in A. And you'll hear, for those that are new to this, you'll hear that it sounds pretty much like the minor pentatonic with an extra note, because that's what it is. Here's the flat six. Again. One more. Mm -hmm. So so the blues scale is great because it's useful for the blues, obviously. Uh, right. But it adds that extra note, which can sound really cool um, in licks and things like that. And it adds a little bit more flexibility, I think, to the scale. Yeah. Yeah, and that, uh, that it's a nice connecting note that flat five um, to you know to the fifth note. I mean, it it just gives that really the half step thing. Yeah, works good in metal too. Of course, Metallica made a mint off of you know half step movement. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah. But in blues, yeah, it works. A lot of people have made a lot of money off the Meyer pentatonic scale and the blues oh. scale. Oh, definitely. You know, and that's one of the uses for um, scales. I mean, why it's well, before we get too far, maybe talking about these scales, why is it important to learn scales? Uh, I just got done reading something on Reddit by Bob Dylan, who basically thought it was useless to learn scales. He thought it was more important to be able to deliver emotion through, you know, the guitar. Uh, I shouldn't say useless, but I guess he wasn't he didn't find it as important to learn scales. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, a lot of people who responded to that article on Reddit said, well, then how do you develop a solo? You know, if you're playing lead, where do you go? And so the scale sort of gives you the alphabet from which to make words, words being the licks or even the right. sentences being licks or whatever the case might be. Uh, if you want to use the word analogy, if you will. Uh, so I would, I would disagree with, uh, Mr. Dylan. He's made a lot of money playing guitar and singing, so he's got something to what he does, but I think scales are important to learn. Well, uh, yeah, not to slam on Dylan, but um, I'm going to. And that is that <laughs> he made a lot of money um, writing songs and saying things with words. He didn't make a lot of money because he was a great soloist, either right. on guitar or harmonica. So that, that was never his forte. And so I would uh, venture that he's not really expert in those specific fields. I mean, certainly his, his poetry and his prose is, is uh, very good. Uh, or at least you know, many people think so. So, I mean, that's good. 
Um, but yeah, I, I, I disagree as well. I mean, it, you had a good analogy, and that is that um, scales and arpeggios are, are building blocks, our vocabulary, basically, that, that you can use then to put together sentences and phrases. And, you know, not that you couldn't string words together without knowing their meanings, you know. Right. Um, but they may be aesthetically pleasing, but they may not mean very much. <laughs> Right. So, um, and you know, you can certainly overdo it. I mean, I, I was a big scale player when I, in my formative years, and so a lot of my stuff ended up sounding scalar. You know, runs up and down. You know, stepwise because maybe because I didn't put enough work into arpeggios, or you know, maybe I didn't jump enough quickly enough into uh, constructing solos and improvisation. Um, mm -hmm. But, but it's still a good tool. I mean, you kind of have to know the rules, and then you break them. Right. You know. Right, and I've heard that many times. Uh, know the rules, then break them. It's, you just can't sort of break them at random, if you will, without knowing what you're what you're doing. Right. Um, yeah, you know, uh, another guitarist that comes to mind when you talk about you know great songwriter, maybe not the greatest guitar player in the world, is Kurt Cobain. Right. Again, you know, not considered to be like the greatest guitar player in the world, but one hell of a songwriter for sure. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you did quite well with that. Um, so let's go ahead and do another scale. I think what we'll do is I'll play it in A just because we've played the pentatonic in uh, A. Mm -hmm. And if I would have thought maybe a bit more ahead about this, I would have chosen C. But hey, what are you going to do? All right. So why don't we play a major scale in A? So I played through both octaves just so that uh, you can hear up and down the fretboard. Mm -hmm. And so that was your first scale, huh? Yeah. Actually, my the first version I learned was the stretch with the, uh, the first position. So it would be like an A. I would have my index finger. Uh, I'm not plugged in. I'm sorry, folks. Um, but it would be a five fret stretch. Okay. So fifth fret, seven, nine. Then again, five, seven, nine. Then six, seven, nine, six, seven, nine, seven, nine five um yeah if you and it's the same exact uh scale if you just slide everything down so your first uh finger your second finger rather is on that fifth fret then you get the form that you had yep yep um but yeah i mean that's the other way to well we're not going to get into that <laughs> there's a <laughs> lot of ways to think about scale um but yeah that's that's a good position to learn because it keeps uh each finger sort of owns its own fret you stay within a four fret um, yeah. shape. Um, the version that I did, especially when I was younger, because I was 14, I was a little smaller, still had a strat scale guitar, so that five fret stretch was uh, challenging. Sure, sure. But, well, and a point actually that you bring up is, is a really good point, and with the minor pentatonic, the blues scale, and the major scale, and all the scales that we'll talk about tonight, or uh, may talk about tonight, they all have multiple fingerings that allow you to run up and down the fretboard. So, you know, there are um, seven different fingerings for the major scale. There's actually for any mode, there are seven different fingerings. Um, mm -hmm. They're all the same. They're just different. The roots are in different places. And so, um, you know, it, it doesn't really I don't know if I want to say it doesn't matter which one you learn first, because maybe some are easier than others. But ultimately, you're playing the same notes, um, right. it, you know, up and down the guitar. And it's actually good to know all of these fingerings. Um, for example, when I was first learning to play, uh, probably I started this too early in my playing career, but I learned all five positions for the pentatonic scale mm -hmm. very quickly so that when you solo, you know, the idea is to move up the neck, if you will, I could more comfortably move up the neck. And after a few years of playing, I can move up and down the neck in the pentatonic with a blue scale without any problem. Right. Um, That's important. Yeah. And I'm certainly not there though with the major scale, mostly because other than scale exercises, I don't do a lot with the major scale. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, what's interesting about the scales, and you kind of led into this, and it's funny because and going back to what I did in the last two weeks, um, <laughs> I, the way I think about scales, I, I kind of forgotten where I picked this idea up. And that is um, I, I learned every position starting with the index finger on a fret. So let's say you're an A. And you're going to start with my with index finger on the on the fifth fret, and you're going to play in that position. The, the next thing I would play would be the same notes, okay? But now starting with my index finger 
on the, the second note of the scale. So now we'd be on the B note on the seventh fret, okay? This is not now, if you start and end with that note, it's no longer a major scale. It's a Dorian scale, okay? Right. So all the notes of the A major scale, but started and, and ended on the B note, okay? Um, that's one way to think about it, <laughs> okay? Um, and then, of course, every, every, these are called modes, okay? So they go from, uh, if you then take the next uh, note, say it start with a C sharp, Okay, and play all the notes of an A major scale, but begin and end with a C sharp. The notes are all uh, the uh, half steps and whole steps in, in between those notes are in a different pattern than they are in a major scale. This gets pretty heady, and we're going to have to do a show about maybe one mode, you know, and, and yeah. discuss how it relates to a major. Um, but the point is that you can get all those same notes now in a different area of the of the neck, kind of like learning all the positions of a minor pentatonic, but now with, with major notes. So anyway, um, a couple of weeks ago, there was a Music in the Park uh, jazz show in Lewisburg, and I went to see the uh, guitar player, uh, Rolf Sturm, who turns out, he, he was a my guitar teacher for a few months when I was in high school. And he was explaining, and then he, he also did a, a scale um, instructional uh, book, two volumes. And so I looked it up on, uh, on the net, and that's where I learned this. <laughs> all, it's like, yeah, Rolf taught this to me all those years ago um, in the way that I think about these things. Um, and it's, it's a little heady. It's a little weird uh, um, to think about it this way because most people just think, okay, major in this position, major in this position, major, you know what I mean? Right. Um, but what's nice about this is once you wrap your head around um, the fact that all these different modes, all these different scales really are the same notes just – but it started and ended on different notes, different degrees. Um, then all of a sudden the whole fretboard opens up. That you'll be able to connect the whole fretboard uh, and have kind of a map in your head, which is a good idea. I mean, you, you should go out there and, and Google, you know, listeners, go out and Google, <laughs> um, like fretboard map or whatever, and, and they'll have like major, I'm sure they'll have minor in the different modes, and I'll just show you all the kind of allowed notes you yeah. know, and you'll see all the patterns that are possible. And, of course, it'll take a long time to practice them all to the point where you know where you are, wherever. But that's kind of what you want to end up with. And it's a good visual for that. Right. Yeah. And, and it's something I need to do because I think I have a good sense of that with the minor pentatonic, you know, the blues mm -hmm. scale. But, boy, certainly not with the modes of the major scale. Um, and I think what got me to... The proficiency I have with the minor pentatonic, not that I'm super great at it, but where I, what got me there was um, backing tracks Absolutely. and, you know, playing around, trying to invent solos, just trying to play around and screwing up a lot and getting a sense of, you know, where notes are. And now I can say pretty confidently with any key, um, I can jump around the, the fretboard of the minor pentatonic scale and uh, I think do fairly well. Um, Absolutely. You know, and so I think that's the number one, one of the big important ways of, of doing this mapping and this connecting of the patterns is just by playing and just, you oh, know, sure. by sitting down just and, and doing it. And it but it takes time. There's no, there's no magic wand. I like to tell my students um, in physics, there's no magic wand I can tap on your head and all of a sudden you know everything about physics. The same thing is about guitar. You've got to just sit down and do it and, and woodshed and just beat it into you and eventually you'll get it. Absolutely. And, um, you know, the hard part is we try to jump too fast. I mean, we want, to, we want to just know the whole neck. And you really can't do that. So I'm sure what you did with the minor pentatonic was, okay, here's this position. And, of course, that it, when, when that was all you knew and you were doing backing tracks with that, that's what you practiced. And then you right. got a, a different position, the second position. It's like, okay, now I'll just play in this position. And yep. then you kind of hammer that into your head over a period of time. And then after that, it's like, okay, well, now I can put these two together. Yep. Okay. Or maybe yep. you learn the third position. And once you had all five positions, then you put them all together. And the same goes for um, all the different uh, major modes. You know, you practice your first position, you know, A major that you showed at the beginning of the show. Um, and then at some point in the future, it's like, well, um, I can learn the, the D Lydian mode. All the same notes as A major, you know. Um, and once you learn that pattern, then it's like, well, now I can jam to a song in A major and play this D Lydian scale. Now I've got a whole other position, right? You know. And then once you learn the, you know, connecting positions inside, then hey, I've got that that bit of the uh, fretboard mapped out. 
And eventually it gets to the point where I just have the whole thing. They right. do it in all the different keys. <laughs> and then yeah. you're an expert and you're, you know, as old as dirt, but that's okay because people that's okay. come yeah. to see you play. <laughs> right. It's a journey, you know, it's a journey. Uh, we are running a little long, which is fine. I think though, before we wrap up any discussion on scales, we should probably go ahead and play the minor scale uh mm -hmm. as well uh so how do you pronounce it aeolian is that how that's pronounced yeah aeolian. so the ionian scale that's the major scale we call the major scale the minor scale is aeolian and let's see what the aeolian scale you're flatting what the third and the seventh and the sixth and the sixth yes so, so it's I'm your trying to remember yes my guitar instructor shaking his head it's like you knew this at one point i did i did know this <laughs> at one point so all right uh we'll go through and uh play And so it sounds sad and depressing because it's the minor scale. <laughs> yes. Sad. <laughs> that, now, that is um, one of the popular – well, that's probably the most popular minor scale. There are variations. Um, there are uh, harmonic minor, which is the same scale you play but with a raised seventh. Okay. Um, so it actually has a major seventh in it, which sounds really weird in Eastern. Um and the reason it's called harmonic minor is that gives you in the five chord in that uh, key now is a major chord, which kind of leads your ear back to the, the main, you know, root chord. Um, so they call it harmonic for harmony. Um, and then there's, there's, of course, other kinds of minor chords, but those are the big ones. Interesting. Okay. So when you were talking about that, that led me to think of the 12 bar progression for blues and you end of the turnaround on the five. Right. which draws your ear back to the root. Exactly. Um, unless you want to be really annoying to somebody and end on the five, and then they just get sort of like, you know, frustrated. Like, there's something not right here. Like, right. <laughs> the song's not over, is it? It's a good old resolution. <laughs> yep. So um, any comments uh, before we wrap up about how the minor scale is used uh, or where, uh, besides the harmonic? Um, well, everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> It's there's a lot of different it, blues is used a lot and there's uh, sure. different minor scales that we'll get into. If you think of it as a minor scale, as long as it has that flatted third. So there's different types of minor scales. Well, the harmonic minor we talked about, the natural minor, you know, which we talked about, which is also the Aeolian, Aeolian mode. There's also Dorian mode and Locrian yep. mode. These are all kind of minor scales. Um, yeah, and we uh, can Mixolydian. go over them. Mixolydian is a major. Actually, has a major third in it. Oh, that's um, right. That's right. I mm -hmm. forgot. Yep. yep. Um, so what's the other one? Phrygian is another uh, minor. So, and we can go over these, you know, in the future. We'll, we'll probably do like a, a different mode in various shows in the future and get the sound of that or something. Yeah, we should do because that. They all and sound different and it's fascinating. Yeah, it, it, that'd be a good... It could, it could be a very interesting sh series of shows for people or a very boring series of shows. Yeah. For people. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll put in this segment and we'll say, okay, skip forward to this point. Yeah, right. <laughs> don't, want to, don't want to hear the mode. Right. <laughs> so, all right. Well, uh, I think our half hour is, is up or, or close to it. Time flies. Uh, yeah. Time flies when you're having fun. Hopefully our listeners are having as much fun as we are uh, making this. Um, please. If you're not, us. let us know. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Let us know on Twitter at SST show and we will do our best to address any and all feedback and or Facebook. Um, you can look us up on Facebook through Jester Cat, our um, studio, our studio company. And so I guess what we'll do is wrap it up and say until next time. Remember, just keep picking and grinning. Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure is a production of Jester Cat Studios. You can see more about this and all other Jester Cat shows at JesterCat.com. You can also email the show at SST at JesterCat.com or continue the conversation on Twitter at SST Show. You can follow Robert at RS Macy, Jesse at Jester 700, and Chris at CW Culp. Thanks to Jesse for playing and recording our intro music. 